Alexander the Great um, <clears throat> conquered part of India. As he was conquering the parts of these, these cities over there in this region, the people begged him not to kill the dragons that were sacred to them. And he said, what, what dragons? He said, oh, outside the city in the caves, there are dragons and we take sacrifices out to them. Alexander reported that, uh, you know, he said, I told him I wouldn't kill them, but I would like to see them. When he went out to see the dragons, the dragons stuck their heads out and hissed at his soldiers and scared them half to death. That's in, I don't know if it's in his diary or what, the records of Alexander the Great. Uh, this Roman mosaic, made out of small pieces of tile, you know, stuck together, was made about the second century after Christ. It shows two long-necked dragons fighting. Or necking. Can't tell what's happening for sure. Man, that would be necking, wouldn't it? Uh, anyway, how on, earth, how on earth would the Romans know about dragons in the second century after Christ? Now, here you got these modern scholars saying, you know, nobody's ever seen a dinosaur because they lived millions of years ago. Well, how did they depict them on their pottery then? Uh, St. George is famous for slaying a dragon in 275 A.D. He was later martyred for his faith. He's the patron saint of England and Portugal. Uh, St. George and the dragon. This would have been in the first couple centuries after Christ. If you ever try to read the old Beowulf story, I've got the story in, in uh, my library there. Old English Beowulf is extremely difficult to read. I mean, you can only understand a few of the words, okay? Because English has changed so much since 583 A.D. But the Beowulf story is interesting. I've read it several times. He killed Grendel the dragon by pulling off his arm. The story says Beowulf grabbed Grendel the dragon and pulled off one of his arms, and the creature fled out of the room and then later bled to death. Well, most anybody that studies a T-Rex will tell you, even though he had ferocious head and ferocious teeth and was, you know, huge, his front arms are pretty tiny. And if you could ever get a hold of one, you probably could jerk it right off. Hmm. They found an ancient Babylonian cylinder seal. This is from the book by Bill Cooper, After the Flood, a tremendous book. He traces the history of what happened to Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Where did their kids go? You know? And has found some amazing records, done great research. Now, Bill Cooper is a very sick man. He lives in England, but he's, uh, I believe, dying of cancer. Last report I got. But this picture is from his book about a Babylonian cylinder seal. It would have been about 600 B.C. Again, it shows a man pulling the arm off of a dragon. What a way to fight a dragon. Grab his arms. Uh, pictures from all over the world, ancient legends, ancient pottery, shows dinosaurs on it. Here's from the book, The Ancient Near East in Pictures, uh, shows a picture of two long neck animals. I would say a dinosaur they're trying to depict here without much question. This uh, another piece of ancient pottery shows two long neck dragons and they're holding a sheep. Now, if dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, like the textbook says, how did these people know to depict them on their pottery? Here's a hippo tusk made of ivory uh, that was carved to be a magic wand or whatever for an Egyptian grave, found from a 12th century B.C. tomb. 1,200 years before Christ, it's even before King Solomon, um, chose an animal with a long neck and a long tail. Now, a giraffe has a long neck, does not have a long tail. The only animal I know that has a long neck and a long tail is a dinosaur. There are stories and legends from countries all over the world. I, I, every place I travel, I see stuff like this. So I grab my camera and get a picture, you know. Uh, Thai seafood restaurant showing the head of a dragon on their boat. Now, why would they build boats with dragon heads on them? There's a Russian medallion showing a man slaying a dragon. A Bulgarian postage stamp has a guy slaying a dragon. Irish writer in 900 A.D. reported that somebody killed a dragon with iron nails on its tail. Probably the Stegosaurus, of course, though several dinosaurs had these big spikes on their tail. There are several websites about dragons. I don't, none of them that I'm aware of. I haven't, didn't read through all of them, but they're all uh, secular. They're not at all Christian that I could see. But they do keep um, interesting articles about dragon stories from ancient literature. So if you want to get into the study of dragons, it's really pretty interesting to see all about the dragons. The Viking ships. 
had these dragon heads on them. If you study Scandinavian literature, you can see the dragon head on this one. Ancient Scandinavian literature has an awful lot of stories about the kraken or the giant dragons of the sea. We figure that the Vikings are the guys that are going around the ocean in their boats, you know, conquering villages. Where's the hardest place to exterminate an animal totally? In the water, in the water yeah. Especially the ocean. <laughs> on land, you could eventually corner it, figure out some way to get it, but on the ocean, you'd have a tough time. And so there are th this is from 1000 A.D. Here we have evidence of dragons living with man just 1,000 years ago. In the book called The Unexplained, uh, there's information about this. There's also uh, an account of a dragon called Nithhogger that the Vikings was killed in the book After the Flood by uh, William Cooper, Bill Cooper. According to the Norse legend, Siegfried slew the dragon Fafner that was... The dragon had made its home in a cave, and somebody else had buried a treasure in that cave. I'm sure the dragon didn't know that and didn't care, but the people wanted the treasure, of course, so you got to kill the dragon to get to it. Several, there are several different stories about the, how Siegfried, Siegfried slew the dragon. Uh, of course, you know, legends get twisted with time. One story says he dug a pit because they knew the only soft part of, of the dragon was his belly. So he dug a pit and laid in this pit until the dragon went over him, and then he jabbed his sword up into the dragon's belly. That's one story. Another one is he just charged up there and just stabbed it in the heart, you know. Who knows how it really happened. But Carl Schuker is a scientist in England, has a great book called Dragons, A Natural History. I've got it in my library. Just story after story of people slaying dragons down through history. Marco Polo reported in his memoirs, when he came back from China, he said, the emperor in China raises dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Ceremonial dragons. Well, all you have to do is go to any Chinese restaurant, and you'll see dragons all over the place. It's just a part of their culture. Over in China, you probably saw them all over, didn't you? Well, they, they have a different connotation than they do in the West. You see, they represent the king. They're, they're very positive. In the West, they're bad. In China, the dragon represents the king, and it's very good. Interesting. Well, why on earth would Marco Polo come back and say, the emperor is raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades? I think it's probably because the emperor was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. <laughs> Marco Polo was an extremely famous man. Well, he wouldn't want to do something dumb and jeopardize his reputation, I don't think, anyway. Uh, a city in France was renamed Nurluk in honor of the man who slew the dragon in the city. I think if we actually could get an unperverted view of history, we would see there's an awful lot of legends that are based on some kind of real story. If you go to the Grand Canyon, you will find carvings on the walls of the Grand Canyon. The Indians did this all over. They call them pictograph, including a picture of a dinosaur. If you look at dinosaurs, many of them had the upright posture, we call that. They walk on two legs, and the front two legs, we assume, were, you know, held up off the ground, similar to an ostrich, I guess, uh, upright posture. Though there are some animals like frogs that walk on four legs. The front two are real tiny, the back two are really big. So the size of the leg doesn't mean he didn't walk on it, necessarily. But why would they carve dragons on the walls of the Grand Canyon? Here's another one with a round body, four legs, long neck, long tail. Dr. Delancey was a dentist in Pennsylvania um, who took these pictures. His wife, Margaret Delancey, um, his widow, she uh, lives in Percocet, Pennsylvania. Right? I've preached up in that city four or five times, right near there, Sellersville and up just north of Philadelphia. That's south, of, you're from Allentown, though, right? Up That's south, of south of Scranton. Yeah. Um, he's the one who took these pictures, and she let me use these. Uh, in the Aboriginal caves in Australia, there are many legends of dragons from caves in Australia. This was just sent to me. Agawa Rock Art from, however you pronounce that, uh, Lake Superior Provincial Park, Ontario, Canada. Notice the outline of the dragon with the bumps on his back. This is called cliff art, rock art. There's another name for this. Uh, some people call it oop art. That'd be a good quiz question. O-O-P means out of place. Out of place artifacts. And so they get the name Oop Art. Um, that's just a slogan that people use. So if you find something that shouldn't be there, 
If you're digging down in the ground and you're down in area where it should be from, you know, 500 years ago from some Indian civilization, and you find an Evinrude outboard motor, that would be an out-of-place artifact, right? That shouldn't be there. So Upart is out-of-place artifacts, things that really shouldn't be there. This type of stuff is by the evolutionist, a person who believes in evolution, often will classify this kind of material as, oh, we don't understand it, it's an enigma, you know, forget it. I've got whole books of these enigmas that they can't explain.